This episode of Quality Irrelevant is brought to you by Hopkins Family Witch Finding Supplies. Do you have a witch problem in your town or neighbourhood that needs to be taken care of quickly and decisively? Do you associate intelligence and creativity with evil magic and the work of the devil? Do you have a problem with empowered women and don't know how to express your own inner rage and inadequacy except through violence and oppression? Here at Hopkins Family Witch Finding Supplies, we've got everything you need. From laminated copies of the Lord's Prayer so you can make sure suspected witches can recite it from memory, to extra sharp titanium edged needles for jabbing into the backs and faces of women you just don't really like the look of. We even have extra strong double weave hanging rope and waterproof bindings for drowning innocent women, good for amateurs and professionals alike. So come on down to Hopkins Family Witch Finding Supplies if you need a religious excuse for your general rage and hatred towards women, and tools to enact your pathetic frustrations because you probably can't get a girlfriend and Gamergate is pretty much dead by now. Hopkins Family Witch Finding Supplies. For impotent fucksticks everywhere. Uh, so who are the family Hopkins? Is that Sir Anthony Hopkins of the stage and screen? I couldn't say for legal reasons, but what I can say is that yes, it is. It is Anthony Hopkins Family own a witch finding supply company. Well, I mean, that is fairly typical for those disposed to the theatre, the actors. They tend to be quite um, eccentric and bold. You know, they it's not a crime, it's passion. It is. It's fine to just walk around the streets with your fists out, twirling them around. You know, it's like, if you're an actor, you are passionate. You scream at things, you break things, you hit women in the face. It's all fine. It's art. Yes. And for people like, you know, your Sean Connerys, the women, they just like it. Ah, yes. Like when you just hit them in the face. That's the normal excuse. Yeah. They just like it. They prefer it when you are hitting them in the face. Actors, thespians, they have a, a heightened emotional range. So where uh, for someone like you or I, it would be blinding rage and hatred. For them, it's just good art. I um, appreciate that you've excluded us from anything to do with performances or acting or attempting to be creative in any way. We are very much distinct from that. Oh, yeah. And not to get too much into self-analysis, but I think we can safely say that we are far, far from the creative passionate energy of the acting breed and class. We are the opposite end of the spectrum to Anthony Hopkins. What is the opposite of Anthony Hopkins? Um, Russell Brand. That's pretty good. You came up with that much quicker than I thought you would. Yeah. I was expecting us like to have to think a bit more. I, I was thinking along the lines of sort of like uh, Dennis Nedry or someone. Yeah, but I, I feel like if Anthony Hopkins and Russell Brand were ever to like run at each other, um, they might just cancel each other out, and both would just vanish from existence. Now I'm detecting a lot of uh, tenuous relationships between a lot of the things you're saying and the topic for the week, but. We're technically still in the ad read bit. Oh. So um, we need to sort of like finish on a quick thing, like a snappy little bit, and then we can fuck off out of this section and talk about stuff properly in a different bit. It's how podcasts work. Okay. Um, exclusive. Anthony Hopkins burns women alive. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, fuck it. We'll go with that. I'll say allegedly if you want. You can cut it in later. <laughs> I don't think it works if you just say, oh, I'll say allegedly, <laughs> but... <laughs> I'll just do it as a vague allusion towards um, it not being true. But it's definitely true. So I was thinking of doing a bit of preamble before we get into the recriminations and sentiments bit of the show, because this is a show now. It's a show. It is a show. Are we live? Um, oh, the light is on. I can see that we're live. Yeah, we're live somewhere, even if it is just to each other. <laughs> <laughs> that counts, right? Technically, this is now a live show because it is live when we are recording it. Yeah, because we're here. Yeah. So we are each other's audience. 
That's how that works, right? That's sad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there was talk of witches in that ad read, if I recall. There was. Now, that may relate in some tenuous way to the topic of the week. On the one hand, it's about those amongst us that wish ill will on the community. But it's also a great excuse to be misogynistic. Hooray! Yeah, because everybody needs more of those. Exactly. We can't just have chauvinism. It's it's got to be folklore. There's got to be a mythology around it to justify what's going on. But my question is, are witches always female? Because I recall a time when I was watching a show or a movie of some kind, it was possible for men to be accused of being a witch. Uh, and I thought that was weird because I thought they would be accused of being a wizard or a warlock. But I guess that sounds even stupider when you say that out loud, like in a courtroom. Yeah, I also feel like uh, in fiction, at least, wizard has more of a positive connotation. Like when they go, oh, that man is a wizard. You just think of your Gandalfs, your Dumbledores. Yeah, the good natured, um, sort of like a deity figure sorting things out like, oh, you'd knock a cup off a table and he'll He'll just like pick it up with his wand and you won't see it. So it's going around fixing things, making things a bit better. Whereas uh, obviously if it is a woman, it is evil and must be stamped out. Uh, so therefore they are a witch. So I guess maybe that is the difference. I mean, it's still gendered, but it is like if you are a bad magic, therefore you are a witch. But if you are playful and coy with a bit of a wink and a, and if you flick the end of your hat, then it's all fine. You can just be like a traveling Gandalf type. I mean, okay, maybe he stops at the odd roadside tavern somewhere and skins a hooker or something, but that's all fine. He brought fireworks at one time. Yeah. And he um, kills a Balrog. So, it, it, you know, we can forgive him for occasionally killing a woman. Whereas if a woman tries to practice early forms of medicine in any way, uh, it, it's it's her fault. Yeah. It's all her fault. She did it. And I mean, obviously there is some way of looking at it where you could consider that Gandalf is sort of like a wandering homeless. <laughs> and in that case, if he's like going around killing women, slightly less forgivable... Uh, but he's a friendly chap to most, to the friend of the hobbits. I thought that homeless people were sort of like up there with the mythical creatures, like leprechauns and elves, you know. They're like a bit magic. They're human-like, but they've got kind of like a charm, and I mean that in the sense of being charming and like a glamour like a sort of a power, like, like a spell, you know, and that's what's going on there. It's not the failings of society. Yeah, it's not that people just like don't look at them or make eye contact because they don't want to give them any change. It's uh, it's a glamour that yeah. the magical homelesses have put on themselves to hide themselves from the uh, sinister elements of society. Yeah, it's like a really good trick that the powerful like to say exists, where it's like you look at the victim and you say, ah, they are doing that. It's their fault. It's their fault that they are invisible to the upper classes. Uh, I think we're stumbling around a critique in here somewhere, but it's just kind of <laughs> ham-fisted and ill-thought out. Yeah, there was some vague element of commentary in there, but all it boiled down to was what if homeless people are magic? I mean, they do live under bridges. Yeah, that is a magical trait. Yeah, there's a bit of a, a trope of the folkloric characters that some of them do live under bridges. Yeah, uh, they have powers. Um, they can sprout wings from their back. I've seen they practice journeyman level necromancy, I believe. Yeah. They can commune with the animals. Yeah. If you cut the tail off of one of them and grind it up and put it in a potion, then you gain good fortune and a cure for erectile dysfunction. So try it at home, kids. Yeah. And they know the, the backwards way through the town. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm, I'm struggling to see if that's a euphemism or not, or a, <laughs> some sort of like code. No, it was one of those things where I started talking and I didn't really know how I was going to finish. Yeah. It's like looking at a culture that we don't have to involve ourselves with and then prescribing a mythos to it and saying, ah, oh, that's what this must be about rather than face the reality. I guess that's, that's what being a witch is all about, really. It's, I don't want to have to face the hardships of the world. I know I'm going to pretend that someone is like a um, an otherworldly sort of thing that doesn't really exist, probably. Yeah, if I can blame my problems on being cursed, yeah. then that makes my life easier rather than actually accepting my own failings and having a shave and getting a job. Although, what if... Being a witch is like being a Cylon. Well, you don't know that you're a witch and you look like a normal. As in like they exist in our world, you know, amongst us and we don't know, but they don't, they don't like us. No. Not friends. No. Yeah. Yeah. Bad. So it could be like that, like the early form of the witch could be like the Cylon. And it's like, oh, I bet you're the Cylon. I mean, a witch. <laughs> I, be- I bet that's the case. Yeah, but you do that in a crowded room full of people and everyone just thinks you're weird. Yeah. If you say that you can see like a woman in a red dress all being sexy in your ear for some reason and there's Edward James almost in the background being drunk and throwing up on himself. And then her eyes like one red light just goes across and then back the other way and she goes I will kill you <laughs> I'm actually better knowing that never happened in this show <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously they uh, they assimilate Picard and um, everything goes downhill from there what the fuck are we talking about <laughs> oh there's nothing here it doesn't matter well it has given me a brilliant idea for uh my new fan film which is called witches v cylons colon dawn v witches that's not bad actually what was the previous one you wanted it was like wizards versus robots or something uh, it might have been wizards versus robots the thing that i'm trying to dance around is the idea of being a social pariah yeah because i think that's what a witch is it's not not so much that they are actual magic and will turn you into a frog. No, it's the idea of living on the outskirts or under things or like... Are we going back to homeless people now? <laughs> yeah, I guess we are a little bit. When you say under things, you mean under some flattened cardboard boxes. Yeah, you'd have thought if they were magic, they could get something a little bit better. Maybe that's a trick. What, maybe they're, they're actually in a castle, but you just can't see it. Yeah, I'd like to believe that. But the robots can see it. Well, I... I would fucking hope not or the fucking war is going to be on our hands you know blood on the streets homeless versus robots see in my mind it's one of those things where it's you know uh, like underworld where they try and make out like oh this is a war in the shadows that has been going on for centuries but humanity never sees it yeah and it's really shit but it's the only thing that Kate Beckinsale is doing these days it's like that but first off you've got the mind-blowing thing that oh there are robots I don't know who made them. They sort of just happened. Uh, Maybe someone like spilled some old Tizer on a calculator and it became a robot. I mean, all of this is going to be in like the prequel movie that we're probably going to make because we run out of money. And then also there are wizards. That's pretty mind blowing as well. Like, oh yeah, by the way, there's wizards and some of them look like homelesses. And then they fight and we get the Oscar that just what as in the one as in it's whittled down to uh one oscar for best film featuring robots and homelesses <laughs> yeah well that year they'll just melt down all of the other oscars and just make one massive one uh, and just give it to us i mean i'm looking into a crystal ball and that's what it's showing me so well that's what i was thinking you mentioned melting things down and all i thought of was a big cauldron and i was like yes i like that that's very witchy <laughs> yeah I, I like that and then i stopped thinking about what you're actually saying and just thought about cauldrons and (laughs) potions and things well that's completely understandable you are um heavily into your witch paraphernalia well as a kid i did like the idea of being able to just combine random things and then somehow power would come from that like oh if you combine these things then suddenly properties that none of the individual ingredients have 
you just get those now. Or like you put all of this stuff in a cauldron and then you throw a, like a gross baby in there and then Voldemort comes out. Do you remember those? They were sort of like toy chemistry sets, but they weren't really. They were basically just a way of marketing sweets to kids in a different way. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, make your own gunge and then eat the gunge. Yeah. It's like, okay, you mi- you're basically just mixing different forms of sugar yeah. together. Well, I used to believe that if you just like mix all that into one potion like into one thing it would form something like brilliant like you'd be invincible you'd be bulletproof you'd be hit by a bin truck or something you'd be fine I never tried that I mean I did mix all the various powders and things together and drink it I don't remember the results I think I probably just had a massive sugar rush I imagine your parents probably remember the results which is you had to go into hospital for a week. It's like, oh, he now has diabetes. I'm sorry. The other thing you could do is if you were a poor kid, you could like go out into the car park and find some bricks and then like throw the bricks at the wall and then you get like brick dust and then you could like put that dust in water and shake it up and make like red water. (laughs) And pretend like that's like powerful in some way. Or like you get the brick dust and then you like spit in it and then like rub it on your face and then say something in some kind of lost dead language. Yeah. And then boom, you're in Atlantis. I hope I didn't drink that. (laughs) Thinking back, I hope I didn't drink that brick water because that probably wasn't a potion. No. It was probably just carcinogenic. Oh, massively so. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, we will solve that mystery later because I'm thinking about having a whole section on different potions to brew. (laughs) But we will have a a quick respite from that. Uh, Shall we move on to recriminations and sentiments? I think we should. I forget that the little bumpers, I forget that those don't happen like automatically. Like we don't have like a sound guy. I imagine they just happen in your brain when you have an actual conversation with someone because like you you just veer off into a completely different subject because you've just heard like... Yeah, that's not our music. It's not our jingle. But it's like, yeah, my eyes just glaze over. I stare <laughs> off, do that thing when you stare past. Actually, hold on. You know the phrase looking through someone? Yeah. What do you think that means? Are you going to imply that it's some kind of witch thing? I always thought, right, that it meant when you look through someone, what you're doing is it's like as if you don't really see them. You don't see them as a person. You just see them as like, it's almost like looking past someone, even though you're looking directly at them. But does it actually mean that when you look through someone, you see them as they are? As in you see past all the social mores and such, you see through that and you see someone as their true self. I think there's a subtle difference between looking through someone and seeing through someone. If you see through someone, then it's that thing that all of those words that you just said. But if you look through someone, it, you're just not paying attention. Ah, so it's not like you've gained second sight or something. Like you personally look through people more than anyone I've ever met because you're (laughs) so frequently lost in your own weird fucked up imagination slash on a massive caffeine or sugar come down that you do just look through people and as if they're not actually there. Yes, I forget I'm not the only um, thing in existence yeah for a time and then i come to and realize oh my word where am i now (laughs) and then you're in the garden with no pants on (laughs) (laughs) there's something terrifying about that like if you're in the street people will be like my word there's something going on there uh the poor man is is in a state of undress (laughs) if you're just in the garden that does seem like a choice sorry where do you live Do you live in, like, the 18th century? (laughs) That's how everyone speaks around here. Do you live in Downton Abbey times? When I'm going out of, like, a little mushroom house into the village, you know, (laughs) I pass all the fawns and the leprechauns. I forgot that you live in the Smurf village. Yeah, it's a great... The good quality of life, okay? (laughs) And excellent quality, massive hallucinogens. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. The rent is cheap. Uh, Because you have to shrink yourself down in size. It's all fine. Uh, This is going off the fucking rails. Recriminations (laughs) and sentiments. Okay. 
Do you want to go first? No, I want you to go first. Okay, I will. So, recrimination, it's a recrimination. Do we, oh, wait, 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 wait. When was the last time we had a sentiment? I don't remember. I don't think that's important anymore. Yeah, okay, so recriminations. First recrimination. Uh, so first one, quality irrelevant are such wieners. If they weren't so talented, they wouldn't have girlfriends. I give this podcast a one out of a possible five stars. I wouldn't give them any stars, but they're so damn talented. Um, Which I feel like there were mixed messages in there. Phil, have we got old? Do we just not know what the kids are saying? Is it like, oh yeah, you're skilled. Is that like a slur? <laughs> oh yeah, you have aptitude for things. Yeah, like is that looked down upon like, one, I disbelieve that we do, but if we can be considered to be skilled in any way at all, is that now uncool? Has the boat sailed? Have we missed our chance? Is it like now it's better to not have any skills or talents? Yeah, I think these days sort of mediocrity and very middle of the road terrible shit is celebrated like your pewdiepies and your other people like that he's my only point of reference anyone on the youtubes including us we're on the youtubes yeah so i think uh we have been insulted because we show some vague glimmer of talent or creativity and also i think this person might just be jealous because they said if they weren't so talented they wouldn't have girlfriends oh does that mean what that they are talented or we are talented we are talented so it's a very confusing sentence yeah uh okay fuck the rest of the podcast let's just spend the next hour dissecting (laughs) this sorry repeat it exactly okay so it said if they weren't so talented yeah therefore we are talented they wouldn't have girlfriends therefore we do have girlfriends because we are talented right well, that's the end of that. But like, yeah. what, but, but I, but thank you, kind listener, viewer. I'm going to say, I think this might cover it all. Thank you, but fuck you. Yeah, fuck you for uh, being talented and having a girlfriend. See, we can do it. Yeah. We can do it back at them. Oh, you're good. That thing you did was passable. Yeah, well done. Is that is that is that, a, is that a slur now? Well done. I think so. Yeah. Is that yeah? Yeah. Okay. God damn it! You genius! What a world we live in, Phil. How are we going to survive? Oh, we're not. We're going to be first up against the wall when the revolution comes. Oh, when the YouTubers' revolution. I. They seem very apathetic. I mean, angry <laughs> about a lot of things that don't matter. They're um easily upset, but only when in front of a camera. So as you just move the camera away, and then they just sort of blank out. Well, they just become sort of grey, shapeless mass. Um, as soon as the camera moves away, I think. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're always like that. And that's just a very competent use of like filter presets on the editing software. Yeah. I mean, they know their filter presets on uh, Adobe Premiere, but they are also a vague beige paste most of the time. Um, I think we're going to have to move on because we're going on and on and on about this. And also I feel like we're straying into treacherous waters if we start um, insulting sort of like basic skills in creative suite (laughs) software because that is kind of again our wheelhouse. So uh, moving swiftly on. No, it's okay. Just don't shine a light on it and we'll just move on. Uh, So the next one reads This podcast is highly overrated if you are over the the age of 10. It is way too long and if you are an adult there is not enough excitement to stay awake for. If you like magic and mystery, turn to the WB on Thursday nights and watch Charmed. Much more excitement for an adult than this will ever be. I still cannot figure out what the hoopla is all about unless you are a child. To be fair, Charmed is quality programming, so if you have the opportunity to watch Charmed rather than uh, list quality irrelevant, then please do on the WB on Thursday nights. This podcast brought to you by Charmed. I I can smell sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> There's the stench of the advertiser about you, Phil. No, it's very subtle. It's, well, that's what you call viral advertising. Ah, uh, what? Where you inject yeah things into other things yeah 
Okay, so are you saying what we need to do is grind down the MP3s of this podcast, put them in a syringe and just inject them into people's arms in the street? Yeah, and then they will just sort of absorb the content. Saying it's terminal, it's terminal, it's terminal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is that is a very effective marketing strategy. Now, I also suspect that that person may be a time traveller because I'm fairly certain Charmed isn't on the television. Yeah, it was um, the poor man's Buffy. Yes, it was the poor man's Buffy. If you are poor and can't afford to watch Buffy, then watch Charmed instead. Buffy did have a high price to entry. (laughs) Yeah. (sighs) I never watched Charmed. I I used to watch it if uh, it was on on like a Saturday morning and I was bored. But it's a bad show. It's not good. Why is it not good? Let's dish on Charmed. Uh, Well, this is the hot topic of the day is uh, was Charmed good? Yeah, this should be on the soup. What? This should be on the soup. The soup. The soup. (laughs) With Joel McHale on the soup. Oh. I don't want to do this podcast anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. But regardless. (laughs) It's the episode that Theo ruined by saying the soup. (laughs) The soup. That's how we say it in this country, apparently. It's like when people on TV, when they're trying to be British and they say the sewer. The sewer. The sewer. Because all British people are constantly talking about drainage. Yeah, and suing. Oh. Yeah, I don't understand either, but... <laughs> what the fuck is happening? It doesn't matter. We can cut this bit. Okay, do your third <laughs> and final recrimination, because inevitably it's a recrimination. Okay, so the recrimination is this... Uh, I'll just point out this is in all caps. <laughs> okay. Uh, just reads this podcast is worse than Michigan at football it's like driving a stake through my heart every time I finish an episode if you want to get the worst podcast ever get this podcast that sounded very um, just matter of fact at the end there yeah they weren't appealing to any imagery or whatever it was literally just a statement of fact according to them yeah that we are the worst and get this podcast if you like the worst things <sighs> Since when did the role of the critic degenerate to that sort of (laughs) level? That calibre of criticism? It's sarcasm and it's unnecessary. Unless they're actually appealing to people who like bad podcasts. Ah, now we should get in with that crowd. Yeah, that sounds a lot easier than the other way. I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of them are bad. This one's terrible. Yeah, so we should... I don't know. Can people just go online and tell people that our podcast is bad? Because that's cool now with the kids. Yeah, let's do that. Everyone listening to this, just say our podcast is bad. Yeah, please. Like the once would be fine. Anyway, I have some engagement from viewers right here. Oh, sorry. I should probably just say about mine. They weren't actually reviews of the podcast. Oh, what? Uh, They were genuine one star Amazon reviews of the first Harry Potter. That. That doesn't have anything to do with witches. Someone said that if Harry Potter wasn't so talented, he wouldn't have a girlfriend. He does have a. He has a girlfriend called Cho Chang. She was a. She was a Scottish. Yeah, but she was miserable. She was. We are coming out on this podcast as being firmly anti Cho Chang. No, what's the one he got with in the end? Ron. Yeah, she got <laughs> girl Ron. He got off with girl Ron. Girl Ron. <laughs> yeah, girl Ron. Right. Yeah. What's the? How do you mush that into one word? Um, Gron. <laughs> Those those books were great because, as we all know, uh, the person that you do kissing on in secondary school is definitely the person that you marry. Forever. And have kids with. And give really stupid names of your teachers to. The kids, that is. Yeah. What a dick. It's almost like the writer didn't really think that one through and just needed to really end the fucking thing. Yeah. And, like, the end that she wrote was like, oh, it's a bit sort of half-hearted, really. Um, okay, Phil, I'm going to have to stop that right there because that is way too close to the bow. <laughs> now, I've just realised we cannot speak of this. In fact, we shouldn't be able to criticise anyone ever. And speaking of criticising things, I have some recriminations right here because, of course, they're recriminations. Oh, my God. No. Sorry, I just have to applaud that because that was the best segue that we've ever done. That was all right, wasn't it? Let's really shine a light on that. Yeah. And lose our train of thought. Can we just point out exactly how brilliant Theo's segue was just then? Can we just take a minute and just appreciate that? God, it was good. Someone's hammering downstairs. (laughs) 
I can't rightly on a Sunday afternoon sort of like bang on the floor and be like, shut up, shut up. I'm trying to shout at my friend on a podcast. Anyway, going back to my amazing segue that we totally didn't just bugger up. I have some recriminations and sentiments right here, and they're totally not reviews of something else. Listening to the podcast is like attending a party you weren't invited to, where you don't know anyone, and they're all in on a joke, but they won't explain it to you. Chock full of audio tricks and treats, Quality Irrelevant is actually just what its title implies, a podtastic chimera without much substance. That guy gets us. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Uh, We do have the odd little trick in our audio. If by trick you mean those times when you just batted away at the microphone like a cat. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's a trick. I'm guessing if you have the right sequence of audio frequencies, you could program someone's brain into doing something kind of like a spell. So if we just say enough words, eventually... We will be magic. Like in that Harry Potter bullshit, it's like... Is it saying the spell that does the spell? What if What if you have no tongue? I think if you lose your tongue, then you stop being allowed to be a wizard. But it's something to do with the hands as well. I, th- I thought it was all about the wand. Ah, which wasn't a penis reference. Not all the time. Sometimes it was. They did talk about length a lot. Yeah, and girth. <laughs> And they were constantly trying to reinforce the idea the longer it was, it didn't mean it was necessarily better. It's it's what you did with it. Yeah. Right? That was the message of Harry Potter. It's not the length. It's what you do with it. Harry Potter, seven books summed down to one sentence. I mean, you're giving these to teenagers, right? Yeah. Aren't they, isn't the first thing they're going to do just point them at their genitals? Um, probably, yeah. And not do anything else ever. I think that's probably about right. You could just shoot magic at your groin. Well, it's like the argument that why does Harry Potter still wear glasses when he probably could have just fixed his own eyesight with his infinite source of power that he has. Why doesn't he just make his schlong bigger as well? Well, I suppose you always run into that issue with any kind of supernatural anything and like reality, uh, which is why this podcast is going to be a fucking train wreck. It's like in Superman where he... um, went to a children's cancer ward and he he brought with him some scientists from a city that's tiny, that's very, very advanced. Candor? I think so, yeah. And either The he, bottle city of Candor. Have you been? I know it well. Do you summer there? I have a holiday home there. It must be a fucking trek to get there because if Superman just has that in his pocket at that time, then I guess you have to go find where Superman is in the world. It's really inconvenient. Anyway. He went to a children's cancer ward, and apparently the scientists of the city of Candor are very, very advanced, okay? And either he made the children smaller, or he made the scientists bigger, but basically he used the scientists there to cure all the children in that ward, right? Yeah. And then he never did it again. Selfish prick. Yeah, it's like he he did it the once... And that was it. (laughs) So if you were lucky to be in that ward at that time, you got cured. Otherwise, terminal uh, (laughs) death for you. Otherwise, technically, Superman, in having the ability to cure terminal cancer and not curing terminal cancer, he is responsible for the deaths of millions of people. Yeah, Superman, is that what you died in World War II for? No wonder we burn effigies of your corpse on All Hallows' Eve. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to move on because we're fucking running out of time here. Okay, my next recrimination is... Apparently, too much Eye of Newt got into the formula for Quality Irrelevant, transforming a potentially hilarious podcast into an unholy mess. This is one of the oddest releases on iTunes, and it's hard to imagine it finding a broad audience. With the frequent descriptions of rather ghoulish deaths of children, it's certainly too strong for younger listeners. Two stars. Well, it's better than all those one stars we got for Harry Potter. That's true. I don't quite know what redeeming facet we had in that review. Maybe it's because we're potentially hilarious. But we squander that potential by just talking absolute horse shit. I mean, if people don't get along with that, then you're not going to like the next hour or so of this. (laughs) It's just going to be more of this. So get used to it. And I'm going to quickly move on to the third one because fucking hell. 
It's this kind of over-the-top style that makes me avoid anything Quality Irrelevant put out. Surely a little restraint here wouldn't have been out of the question? The hosts are bland, generic 90s children with no personality whose attempts at humour are cringeworthy and painful. The series of segments are so stupid I couldn't even listen to this all the way through. It's a mess of inane half-baked concepts and the parts I did listen to I did so with my mouse hovering over the stop button. Double double toilet in trouble indeed. I like that guy. He's a straight shooter. Yeah, just says what he or she thinks. Yeah. I mean, there's sometimes you just look back at these and you just feel a bit sort of... Disheartened. Yeah, like, ah, oh, that, I mean... Like, maybe we're not as amazing at podcasts as we thought we were. I think I'm good. Yeah, me too. I think we're good. I think we're fine. I like me, so... I win. That's the new tagline for the podcast. Quality irrelevant. I like me. Anyway, so those weren't actually reviews of our podcast. What? I know. Instead, they were actually reviews for the 1993 Halloween fantasy comedy film Hocus Pocus starring Bette Midler. Oh, well, there's a surprising coincidence Oh, yeah, really? I wouldn't have thought it. Whoa, no, really? The topic being about witches and we think of the same (laughs) 90s crap. No. (laughs) No, No, Phil. No, I don't believe that. Shall I do a very slick segue into my fun film fact? Uh, It's Phil's Phil's fun film fact. Oh, I remember those. All spelt with a P-H. Oh, with a P-H. Fun film fact. It's because you were thinking of spelt with with an F. I understand. I was thinking it was spelled with an F and I thought, what? That's not a section. Phil doesn't begin with an F. Anyway, I'm going to do my fun film fact. Okay. Did you know that the set of Disney's 1993 family-friendly occult spectacular Hocus Pocus was actually plagued in reality by dark magic and witchcraft? It all started on day three of the shoot when the craft services table turned into a live bear just as Thora Birch was reaching for a maple glazed donut, and the mishaps only got stranger from there, including Doug Jones mysteriously growing an extra three and a half feet every day he was on set, and Sarah Jessica Parker vomiting bats every time someone said action. After many millions of dollars were paid out in insurance claims and even more were paid out to cover up the mysterious toad-related deaths of half a dozen production assistants, it was ultimately discovered that director Kenny Ortega had offended actress and known purveyor of the dark arts Kathy Najimi several years previously by repeatedly running over her son, and a curse had been placed on the production of the movie as an act of dark vengeance. Fortunately, the movie was a hit and is now beloved by idiot children and lonely women worldwide, so the joke was ultimately on Kathy Najimi as her career is now garbage. Uh, So I assume that is all true. Uh, That is all 100% factual. It is a fun film fact, not a fun film fiction. What kind of hex was it? Was it a hex? Was it a curse? Uh, It was sort of a general curse of like bad fortune Ah. uh, over the whole set. But there were the occasional like specific hex to say make Sarah Jessica Parker vomit bats or Doug Jones to grow an extra three and a half feet every day he was on set. It's a bit of a shame because I don't think either of those actors have ever recovered from those afflictions. No, because Doug Jones is to this day uh, 23 feet tall. He's very thin. Yeah, and as we all know that Sarah Jessica Parker, her head is engulfed in a cloud of bats at all times. (laughs) They're just flying out of her. It's not fun to make fun of Sarah Jessica Parker, really. Like, I understand why we do it in that she was in that film, which is funny, but... I mean... Do you just feel bad for her? Well, not bad. I mean, I think think she's basically just taken a kicking for not being good. (laughs) And we sort of realised that like 10 years ago now. It's not pleasant. Like she must know that she's not good. Yeah, she knows. But to have such a light shone on it the whole time, you know, like when you know that you're bad and then everyone tells you that you're bad, it doesn't really help. We should know. We're doing a lot of talking about ourselves on this podcast. Anyway, have you got a little bit of trivia just to lighten things up? I don't know if you knew this, but speaking of Hocus Pocus, did you know that the Japanese translation of the film's title is Angry Lesbian Coven Eat Souls Happy Halloween? Were they lesbian? I don't think they were. I think that that's a lie. They were sisters. 
But, you know, the Japanese, they just think that and any group of women living together are uh, there's lesbians even if they're fa- sorry especially if they're family <laughs> yeah I think you should just do your fucking nonsense film pitch. I mean, they do have a list of ways to detect a witch, but it's only got one thing on it. (laughs) And what is that? Ask them if they are a witch. Uh, Now, two. Um, (laughs) What I was going to say is if you are trying to detect a witch or you are a witch hunter, well, 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 Phil, if you suspected someone of being a witch, how would you tell? Well, what I would do, my first step would be heading on down to Hopkins Family Witch Finding Supplies. Oh, fuck. uh, And grabbing some extra sharp titanium edged needles and just jab them into the person's uh, back and head and face and neck. The trick is, Phil, what you do is uh, you get someone who you suspect of being a witch, right? And you bring them in, okay? And then you cut off their feet. Yeah. Because famously, witches don't have feet. That's true. So you cut their feet off and then we'll know one way or the other. Yeah. I think the primary element of a witch finding technique is it has to be incredibly unfair (laughs) in that like, you know, it's one of those things where like, oh, if they are a witch, then we like cut the head off and burn the whole body if they are not a witch then they drown you know it has to be like one way they die and that proves that they're not a witch the other way they're alive which means that they're a witch which means you kill them so the core concept of a witch finding technique is a lose-lose situation for the potential witch yeah you might as well just like drop a grenade down someone's knickers and just say like you know, well, if it goes off, then you were a good Christian. You <laughs> died a noble death. Yeah. And if it doesn't, then you're a witch. The idea that somehow innocence means that the fact that you have died a horrible, painful death is fine. Even if God does step in and makes the grenade not go off, that's still evil. Like, that yeah. wasn't God, that was you with your magic. So, yeah, because you're you're using your magic to talk to God. How dare you? How dare you yeah. blow up with a grenade? Exactly. Um, so we're going to slam into my film pitch because my film pitch is also about unfairness and how unfair it is to be a witch. <laughs> I'll buy it. <laughs> right. I'm not going to tell you the title of the film until the very end. Okay. So the film starts with Melissa Joan Hart. Okay. We like her. Yep, so she's facing the camera and saying, I am just your average high school teenage girl and welcome to my normal average everyday life. So this is a film about like teenage life, okay? Like Keenan and Kel or Sister Sister. Well, that's good. That plays well in the youth audience. Yeah, or that other one with the Olsen twins. Mary-Kate and Ashley go wild. or Yeah, or the secret world of Alex Mack. She can turn into a puddle. I remember that. Like most average high school teenage girls, I have cheerleading and homework. But mostly, my wacky family causes all kinds of problems in my otherwise pretty uneventful, but essentially amicable and wholesome life. I like it. It's like setting it all out, laying it all out on the table. I get it now. You know, she's relatable. Yeah. Okay. Nothing bad is going to happen here. It's all it's all fun. But the bit of this whole situation that that is not so average is that we live in 17th century New England, probably somewhere in Maine or Massachusetts. That's how you say it. Perfect first take. It was very impressive. That's right. We're just your normal, average, everyday Puritan separatist pilgrim family living on a plantation. It's basically like living in a religious commune, so... That's a real fucker, if I'm honest. Does she have some kind of uh, headwear that has a buckle on it? Um, For this, yes. But she's also got a flower okay, on it as well, because she's like playful and innocent and a little bit quirky. So yeah, she's like the, the Zoe Deschanel of the Puritans. Everyone has those buckles on their hats, because I assume you're going to ask her about every character that appears. Good. So just preempting that, yes. What are those buckles for? Can you tighten the hat? Uh, it's for tightening that hat so 
your head doesn't spill out. Okay, good. Because witches, see, can explode your brain. All right. There will be some discussion of hats later on, because hats basically make up 50% of my idea. <laughs> okay, so we're going to introduce her family now. There's like, I don't know, there's like seven of these fuckers, right? Because remember how those crappy 90s sitcoms, they would have like a really bloated cast? Yeah. Uh, well, we've got that same sort of wacky dynamic going on here. Okay. We've got Patrick Fabian as the pious and patriarchal father, Leslie Bibb as a demure lady wife, and then we've got their eldest son, played by Patrick Wilson. Nice. Yeah, because he's the new one. But is he like flabby Patrick Wilson or like skinny Patrick Wilson? <laughs> um, He kind of, well, he's going to be flabby to begin with and then get skinnier as, as it goes on. Like he's just sort of a little bit jowly. Yeah, just a little bit with sideburns. Uh, oh, but he's playing like a 13 year old, we'll say 12. 12. 12. Uh, that's going to make it wrong for some stuff coming up in a bit. But... <laughs> oh, Jesus. Anyway, um, and we still need three more kids, so let's just stick in like Harry Potter, Emma Watson, and Rupert Grint, all right? Um, <laughs> they're, they're in there. It's Harry Potter, the character, and not Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> it's Harry Potter, but without all the magic and stuff. Because that would be frowned upon if he could do magic and stuff in the Puritan family. Oh, yeah. Oof. Bad news for everybody. Yeah, although potentially relevant to what's coming up. Oh, spoilers okay so harry potter and emma watson they're like twins about 10 years old and rupert grint plays a newborn i can see that he's got a very baby face it's all good it's not weird so that's the setup of the film melissa joan hart dealing with being a teenage high school 17th century new england pilgrim and her weird overtly puritanical family but it all goes to shit like, immediately. Okay. Because Patrick Fabian really fucks things up for them in the commune uh, because he clashes ideologically with the church, you see. The, the Church of Subway. Church of Subway? Yeah, that's the commune, Church of Subway. Because he thought, right, you should never put more than two kinds of meat in a footlong. But obviously, there's the staple of the Italian BMT that breaks this cardinal rule. Yeah. But the religious leaders of the time, they were sinful in their ways. Yeah. So that was the the conflict there, you know, because you can imagine him standing there like going, oh, what's this? Three meats? I don't fucking think so. Come on, family. We're going off to live in the woods. <laughs> and that's it. They fuck off. <laughs> okay. They just go and live in the woods because of the three meat sandwich. Yeah, they get punished. They're excommunicated because of the sandwich. And they pile up all their worldly possessions onto a rickety cart. Yeah. With Melissa Joan Hart sort of like perched on top. Imagine it's like a huge mound of like oldie worldy stuff like chairs and whatnot sort of piled up really really high and those like very very small stools that i think are supposed to be used for like milking a cow oh yeah there's like 18 of them just like on top so like really unstable the sides of the mound are like overhanging the edges of the cart all their stuff is bouncing up and down on the bumpy dirt track but it doesn't fall off possibly due to witchcraft we're not sure maybe Maybe. Possibly witchcraft. That might come up. I don't know. Anyway, so they go and live in the woods and it's shit. I'll be honest with you, Phil. It, it, it's shit. They have like a little bothy that they sleep in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a dilapidated barn. Um, and they have like a few base level farmyard livestock. Okay. And hay. They've got hay. Yeah. I mean, I mean they're like you, they can't move for hay yeah, oh, plenty of hay unfortunately hay is not a good commodity to have a lot of no maybe they have a bucket as well okay hay and a bucket and you know like a chicken well that's i mean that's all you need in puritan times isn't it it's all fine and so then we get melissa joan hart she looks at the camera and says and if that wasn't bad enough it gets worse. My family all think I'm a witch for some reason. So that's a real pain in the hole. <laughs> Good. Uh, I love the I love this uh, authentic like teenage dialogue. Yeah, and I'm not even I'm not even a witch, so <laughs> I'm not I even one. Not even a witch, so uh, so no doubt this will cause conflict between myself and the other characters in the film. Uh, but trust me, the payoff is good. <clears throat> good. Oh, and there's an actual witch living in the woods. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. We're not sure. Played by... Oh. Uh, Dylan Baker. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. There's, there's maybe, maybe, 
like a like an old hag with no clothes on, with like long grey hair, sort of living in the woods, played by Dylan Baker. Okay. Uh, we're not sure. Can I ask a very important question? Yeah. What kind of hat is he wearing? Um, unfortunately, he's not actually wearing a hat. Ah. I'm going to sell my shares in this movie. I know. I'm trying to sort of move away from the stereotypical image of like the witch with the long nose and all this stuff. So this witch is naked. With no hat. With no hat. No no clothes. How are people going to know that she's a witch? Uh, she has a stick sometimes. Mm, okay. She fine. eats children. She seduces and eats them as well. Does she have a cloud of bats around her? <laughs> uh, that would be giving away too much. Maybe it should be Sarah Jessica Parker. Okay, recast. <laughs> recast. Actually, it's offensive if it's a female, I think. Dylan Baker, you're employed again. You're back in. Okay, Phil. I, oh, God. Okay. I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but there may uh, so there may be a witch in the woods. Okay, maybe possibly, but we're not sure. I mean, who can say? I mean, can you prove that there isn't? Mm, no. With that, yeah. It, so, so the plot is fine because yeah. of that. So it's all, no, that's all fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So f- fuck you. There might there might be a witch in the woods. We don't know. <laughs> No, and you can't give that away. That's like subtextual. Yeah, yeah. So she may be there and we're not sure. Yeah, could be a witch. Is that the title of the movie? There could be a witch. There could be a witch. Uh, Working title, you know, there could be a witch. Um, And every now and then we'll just hear like, (laughs) just like off in the distance, but. Yeah, but that might not be a witch. No, that could be a goat. Yeah, or um, there could be some stand-up comedy going on. (laughs) Exactly, yep. You don't you prove there isn't, Phil. Yeah. Prove it. I can't. You can't. Well, then there we are. There we are. So God, uh, stop trying to make me prove that there isn't stand up comedy in the woods in Puritan times. Yeah. So that's proof. Yeah. Or not. Either way. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm hammering. Like, it, it, okay. It's ambiguous. <laughs> okay. okay. Who, who knows? Okay. We'll go with that. So we're getting to the main meat of the film here, because fucking hell. Patrick Fabian is trying to make a go of it to provide while staying true to his religious beliefs about sandwiches. Uh, but there are hardships, Phil, because he, he's like trying to grow crops by plunging the discarded ends of six-inch subways into the ground, but they won't grow. No. He's toiling in the fields. Ah, I'm toiling in the fields because I'm a farmer now. <laughs> Again... Brilliant, authentic Puritan dialogue. Yeah. Ah, I'm toiling in the fields because I'm a farmer. What are we going to eat this winter? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> He's doing the best he can yeah. considering the circumstances. Um, and by the way, an important note here about Patrick Fabian's costume. He's got no pants on. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, he has a big floppy hat. Yeah. Kind of like a scarecrow's hat uh, with just a huge brim. Like, I mean, we're talking about like a six foot diameter brim. Yeah. And he's wearing breeches with braces because that's old timey. Yeah. With his thumbs tucked under them at all times. You know, so he's, he's constantly got his thumbs tucked in at all times in the film. I'm farming in the fields. Oh, why won't these Subway sandwiches go into blossoming Subway trees with Subway sandwich fruit all growing off of it? And he's not wearing anything at all Yeah. on his torso. Okay. There we are. So whenever he inevitably snaps the braces in prideful confidence, he massively twangs his nipples. Yeah. But he doesn't react. In fact, he's like bleeding from the chest. It's just like bright pink lines and then just the start of just some blood running down. Like he's just started to break the skin. Oh, I just don't know how to provide for my family. (laughs) Also garden shit. (laughs) And my daughter might be a witch. We don't know. Yeah. Because it's ambiguous. I love it. Yeah. Anyway, so weird shit happens on the farmstead. Like, really weird. Yeah. Yeah, like, um, uh, Leslie Bibb's bucket goes missing, oh. maybe. I mean, that's just a disaster on all fronts. And she's upset. She's like, oh, where's my bucket gone? <laughs> I hope that daughter of mine isn't a fucking witch. <laughs> you know, just in case you've forgotten. Forgotten that she might be a witch. So that's, so that's that's weird, right? Yeah, it's very weird. Patrick Wilson, 
is just jacking off constantly while staring at Mitsu Joon Hart, going like, all right, all right, all right, I'm getting older, but my sister stays the same age. I hope she ain't a witch or nothing. Good. This is all conflict and it's all good. I like it. It's meaty. These are the only characters in the film. Of yeah. course they're attracted to one another. What are you going to do? They live in the woods. It's shit. We don't judge them. Yeah. They must be banging each other. So there's this goat, right, that's always around. Yeah. And the goat is played by Gerald Butler. And he's on all fours and he's got big ram horns and he's chewing some grass. Yeah. I'm Gerard Butler the goat. I'm <laughs> definitely not Satan, so stop fucking looking at me. Yep. Good. He's not Satan. He's not Satan. He's not Lucifer the devil. Lucifer the devil. He's not that. He's not. Not. Definitely not Lucifer. Maybe. He might be Lucifer. We don't know. May. You can't prove that he's not Lucifer or that he is Lucifer. Okay, I think you've got the... uh, I've got the ambiguity. Yeah, the rationale of this film, the way we consider the plot. It's like, prove otherwise. You can't, so... Yeah. It's not bad. It's not a bad film. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. In fact, I might just step onto the screen at this point and just say, look... (laughs) I understand it's a slow burner here, but it's not a bad film. You can't say that. Yeah, you can't. You can't prove that it is a bad film. Yeah, so... Get to fuck. Yeah. Anyway, more stuff goes missing on the farm, including Rupert Grint and then... The (laughs) The baby. Yeah. And then the Harry Potter twins are being really, like, fucking obnoxious. So Melissa Joan Hart waves her wand and they both turn into a steak and cheese sub. Well, that's just delicious. Well, exactly, Phil. Exactly. And and it only has one type of meat in it. Exactly. So it works. So when Patrick Fabian happens across the sandwich, he eats it, not realising it's really his kids. Oh, that is... um tragic and dark oh this is a good sandwich but remember i don't know it's my kids oh what's this and then he coughs up and spits out harry potter's hair because that is still in the sandwich yeah just whole just (laughs) what what is happening oh my god i just ate the harry potter twins this is so fucking stupid i just told everybody i don't know about that and now oh my lady wife won't like this at all and she doesn't no uh she tells patrick fabian to head back to subway to get a sandwich for the family because they're starving because he's a shit farmer Uh, like a big massive long one just one Eh, one that we can have half on the way back like a party sub. Yeah, for the for the winter. Yeah. But he's not allowed to give any to Melissa Joan Hart because she might be a witch. She might be a witch. Yeah. Um, and it will be funny because whilst there's conflict there, she'll be like, oh, that father of mine, he tries his best, but I mean, he's a bit crap, if we're being honest here. Um, also, Patrick Wilson has been giving me some really funny looks. <laughs> and been doing some weird stuff while he looks at me. Don't know what he's doing. So I'll admit that the film's a bit bland. It's a bit... Ugh. Yeah. You know, they're in the woods, but... Not not much going on, really. <clears throat> <clears throat> but you can't prove that it's bad. Oh, no, you can't, no. Especially because there's a bit coming up, right? Because it's just going to be weird stuff, like family drama, like, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, oh, why are the Harry Potter twins on the ceiling? Yeah. With their necks turned all the way round. <laughs> Why? It's weird. Yeah. Why has that happened? It could be a witch. Could be a witch. Can't prove that it's not a witch. Melissa Joan Hart, is it you? And she'll be like, no. (laughs) Can't prove that it's me. So, you know, and she'll go back to talking to her cat that can speak with a human voice. And who voices the cat? Um, Billy Zane, of course. (laughs) Just got a very bland voice. Yeah, just like, hello there, I'm Billy Zane. I mean, Salem the Cat. (laughs) I'm in this movie as well. Uh. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. It's good lines. It's classic dialogue. You can see it printed on T-shirts across the land. They didn't give me any lines, so. (laughs) So Billy Zane ad-libs all his lines as Salem the Cat. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'm just standing in this recording booth. 
I, d I don't know, really. What happened to my life, my career? That's why a lot of the cat's dialogue sounds like uh, just a bored man slurping whiskey out of a hip flask. Yeah, you know, and, that, and that's odd. That could be a witch. You can't prove that it's not a witch, which is the important thing. Anyway, we meander around this a lot, but uh, basically Patrick Fabian gets gored by the goat. Okay, well, is that like the the climax? Yeah, yeah, like Rupert Grint has gone missing, the Harry Potter twins had turned into a sandwich and got eight. <sighs> Where's Mr. Patrick Wilson? He, uh, he falls in a thing and breaks his thing, and then Patrick Fabian is trying to understand what's going on. And he's trying to communicate to Melissa Joan Hart. And that's when Gerard Butler runs in with the horns and gores him. Like, fucking stabs him. He's like, fuck you! And stabs him right off in his bits. And Patrick <laughs> Fabian is like, oh, fuck! Oh, oh you fucking... <laughs> oh, shit! Fuck, fuck. But it's all fine. And it's all, it's all okay. Yeah, the movie ends... Uh, it, 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 all, it, it worked out. Does it just sort of end like mid curse from Patrick Fabian <laughs> like he's just going ah, j uh, ah f and then it just ends you're like ah oh, fuck yeah credits uh, that would be good but no it extends a little bit because what happens is Patrick Fabian realises the error of his ways okay I've realised the error of my ways and I've learned a lesson about tolerance uh, I should tolerate witches and goats lest they gore me. Yeah, and that's what happens at the end. They hunt down the witch, played by Dylan Baker, remember? And they turn him into a meatball Mariana. Yeah. Uh, which doesn't even make any sense as a sandwich, so that's why it's evil. No, evil, evil sandwich. Yeah, yeah, that's the devil's sandwich. What the fuck is this? We're putting another dinner in a sandwich. Yeah. You don't put a... You don't have a lasagna sandwich. It's like putting another sandwich into a sandwich. It's satanic. It's weird. Yeah, it's what the witches do. Fucking meatball marinara. Yeah. And that's like the message of the film. <laughs> <laughs> the meatball marinara is not a good sandwich. It's against God. It, it's... Yeah, it, it, it's not. It's not okay. No, it's not okay. Meeble marinara sandwich, not okay. Yeah, the only person who liked it was Patrick Wilson, and ugh, so... We all know what he gets up to, whacking it over his sister. Yeah, oh, dirt, he deserved what happened to him. Yeah. So yeah, they all learned their lesson at the end of the film. I thought it was it was a touching drama. It was. What I will say about it uh, is that for you, yeah, it wrapped everything up surprisingly neatly. Oh yeah, it does actually end. Yeah. It's got a, an ending of a fashion. Yeah, the fashion that is not just you saying and then the film ends. I mean, it does sort of happen like that, but uh, <laughs> we're not... I mean, again, Gerard Butler may be Satan. Possibly Satan. Yeah, but... I, either way, they'll get on. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, apart from when he gored Patrick Fabian, but I guess that's okay now. Because Patrick Fabian was being silly. Yeah, and Patrick Fabian accepted it and that he learnt his lesson from being gored. So therefore, all good. Everybody happy. And would you like to know the title of the film? Uh, yes. Okay, I call this film Clarissa Explains It All, colon the movie, hyphen a New England folktale, brackets origins. Oh my god, I didn't even Close brackets. imagine that it was going to be a Clarissa Explains It All movie. She explained it all. She did. She explained at the beginning, I am being accused of a witch, unjustly, maybe. You definitely can't accuse this film of being false advertising. Yeah, so fuck you, audience. Get to fuck, as they say. And then she turns away from the camera and gets her kit off and then walks into a fire. Yep. And then walks back out and she's got dragons. <laughs> I think you're getting confused with another franchise. I think that's Sabrina oh. the Teenage Witch. Oh, sorry. I, it's easy to confuse those. Anyway, I thought it was a good film. I, there was conflicts. Uh, there was drama. There was hats. Yep. There was um, uh, suggestions of incest. Yeah. Which is popular these days. Well... Here is my kind of review of that movie. 
Yeah, are you going to review the film pitch? Well, yeah, I'm going to kind of give you an idea of what my experience would be like watching it. So if I was in one of those moods where I was just sort of wandering around, didn't really have much to do that day, just sort of wandering around kicking my heels and I wanted an excuse to have a big bucket of Coke, I would probably go to the cinema to see this movie and get a big bucket of Coke, but I would probably be slightly more interested in the drink than the movie, but I would still walk out of the cinema, forget the whole movie immediately, but the memory of the big bucket of Coke would linger. Three stars, some funny bits. Yeah, I think you've confused my film with Season of the Witch. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that that happened. I know. Yeah, it's so similar because of like there's a witch. And then it turns out the witch is actually the devil. Yes. Was it? And the bit where the, the kid was whacking it. That bit was good. That bit goes on for like 20 minutes. It's a bit gratuitous, but um, three stars. Three stars. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, Theo. Um, I don't know what that film pitch was. Have you seen the film called The Witch or not? No. If you had seen that film, it would make way more sense because that's basically what happens in the film. Okay. And the sort of the lethargy and the lack of like content would it sort of make more sense, would be more appealing. Oh, so it was all like commentary. You were offering commentary on your experience watching The Witch. Um, I think it was actually just an excuse to put more silence into my film right. pitches because my absolute favourite response to things is just like a, a, like a pause, <laughs> just like a concerned, like, uh, oh, is that it? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> so the fact that the film itself is so kind of meandering, it's just a bit of an excuse for me to do that, but more. Just lots more. Yeah, just lots more of that. Also, it has Finch from The Office in it as the dad, which is hilarious. <laughs> uh, and I would want to do an impression of him, but I can't. Well, yeah, because you can't get your voice down to that octave. No, to be that bassy and raspy at the same time, it's... Yeah impossible his voice defies physics anyway so uh now that's a good film my film potentially better but we won't go there but um yeah it was about the the struggles of religious belief in 17th century new england and how basically our whole family gets punished for being pious and devout so it's a feel good piece, right? It's like, oh, the children died. It's like a it's like a Sunday afternoon feel good romp. Puritan romp. Sit down with the kids and watch this and be like, "Oh, do you like the bit where the 11-year-old gets seduced by an old woman?" <laughs> it's my favorite bit. Yeah, it's a bit I always ask kids, "Did you like that <laughs> bit?" <laughs> Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I'm not responsible for these things. <laughs> okay? No, it was basically, I saw that film and just thought, wouldn't it be funny if Patrick Fabian was a farmer? <laughs> <laughs> well, good. We got there. That was kind of it. Um, uh, so the podcast has ended. <laughs> Possibly forever. <laughs> Do you want to add anything at the end? I can't think of anything. I'm spent. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I will admit that there was a point that I was just sat here eating pineapple.